Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. And look, that philosophy is not any different than all the Sand Hill Road venture capital guys. It's not any different than Jason Blum making movies in Hollywood. It's the same thing. It's not any different than Moneyball. It's, it's the idea that we can't predict anything. So we have to take many bites at the apple. And many bites of those apples aren't going to win but we're gonna get some big trends. Look, ask Jeff Bezos, why is Amazon successful? They tried a million different things. Yeah. Some of them, some of them became Alexa, but you gotta try. And that's, that's something that we don't really look at in life, at least in the discussion of a life philosophies. We all want to be experts who supposedly can make one bet and it's gonna be right. Whereas if you're making a bunch of bets, you're probably much better off because you're not going to be right. So take a bunch of bets and ride the ones that go your way and let go of the ones that don't. Good morning, Vietnam. Sorry, I've always wanted to do that and couldn't resist uh, when we have a guest dialing into the pod from Vietnam today. Uh, We've joked in the past in a blog post that today's guest probably has a chart showing some huge trend in sugar or something tattooed on his back. Uh, He's a grade A first ballot founding member of the Trend Following Fan Club, having written four books on trend following, which were translated into 14 languages owning the trendfollowing.com URL and being the host of the popular Trend Following radio podcast. Uh, so from the fr- Trend Following beginner to master of the trade, we're sure that Michael Covell's name and works have popped up somewhere for you along the way. Um, we'll be going through all that and more on today's episode. So thanks for joining us, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. How is my uh, Robin Williams there? Do you get that a lot? You know, when you're here, you don't. <laughs> it's, like, it's like being in a parallel universe. You know, yeah, I'm, just so, in this, I'm in this place of uh, money and economics and boom, and it's like a, a, a foreign concept for a lot of Americans, if you've not been here. I have never been there. So tell me a little about it. Tell me about the choice to live abroad. And, you know, you were kind of doing remote and work from anywhere way before the pandemic. So what drove you to go out east there? I was happily existing in the States in 2012 in a nice bank in Hong Kong said to me, hey, do you want to do a speaking tour around Asia? It was going to be like 10 countries, 20 plus cities. I'd been to Asia before, but I thought, okay, this sounds cool. Why not? I'm single. I'll go on the four month, all expenses paid first class tour of Asia to talk to sovereign wealth funds, China asset management, every hedge fund and mutual fund across Asia. Why not? And I did. And it was really fun. You never came back or did you go back and then go back, come back and then go back to Asia? No, I kind of stayed. I mean, I visit the States and stuff like that. But, uh, but anyways, in the middle of that four month tour, I had a two week break and I decided to go to Vietnam. The only country that I've ever been in my life where I knew no one on the ground. I had no contact there. Zilch, nothing. Just the Americans showing up at the communist country where you need a visa you don't speak the language and you don't know anything. And it was the most fun. It was the most fun country in Asia. Hands down, not even close. Of all, what, all the, what countries did you visit? So you started in Hong Kong? I was in Tokyo. I was in Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, Bali, Bangkok, Phuket, 
you name it. And and Vietnam is on the top list. And what town, what area are you in in Vietnam? I'm in Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon, but still called Saigon often. Okay. Who calls it Ho Chi Minh? The locals do? No, the locals call it Saigon. Ah. Yeah. Um, so it's, and it's been fun. What's the virus been like there? I think the Southeast Asia has been pretty good at keeping a lid on it, but how's it been uh, the pandemic? 100 million people in Vietnam, and I think they've had 35 deaths, which wow. I think were the, res- were the result of a Westerner coming into the country and getting into a hospital of old people. So There's it really 100 hit- million people in Vietnam? Sorry for cutting you off. That, yeah, I would have guessed 100, 30. Yeah, 100 million and 35 deaths. Three, five. Ooh, that's so a little better than the U.S. And what, what's everyone there think about us uh, stupid Americans of the politics and all the mess we have over here? Vietnam loves America. I mean, the Vietnamese people love America. Insane respect for. It's almost hard to figure out. I mean, we... <laughs> We sort of started a war here and sort of killed 4 million people and they love America. Even today, they love you more. Or are they starting the shines coming off the, the rose petal? No, or there's, saying is. There's, there's no shine coming off. It's, it's, it's a really deep... Look, I think if, if most Vietnamese had the opportunity to just go on a vacation to America, I think they would all take it just to try. They just all want to experience Remember, there's 5 million American Vietnamese in America. So there is this connection where people in Vietnam hear the stories about America and they want to go and experience it and see it, et cetera. And what you mentioned, it's booming, right? A lot of manufacturing moved out of China and into Vietnam. What's, what's that whole story? Yeah, I, I, booming and a lot of just economic development building, first subway under construction. I mean, since I've been here, yeah, they built the 10th tallest building in the world in downtown Saigon. I mean, it's, it's not, it, I mean, look, their desire, their desire is to reshape their cities to appear like Singapore. Now they're not, they're not close yet, but you can see they will get there. And you'll be along for the ride. Any plans to leave or you're there for the long haul? I don't know if there was a plan to come here. So, <laughs> right. I, you know, just go with the flow. Look, I love it. everyone, every, everyone in America who has been clocking in in a nine to five job for the last 10 years, doing whatever you're supposed to do, the things that I grew up with, right. Uh, start. I'm not married yet. One significant lady in my life, but you know, the things you're supposed to do, start the family, go to the baseball game, all this stuff. And then maybe people wake up one day and they say, well, is there something else that I have not experienced? Well, I'm kind of on that ride. Yeah. You're my, my uh, wife's brother. My brother-in-law has this thing that people should retire first and then work later. Right. Like work when you're older and don't have anything else better to do. And like go travel the world and have fun and do things when you're younger. I like I that know. idea. Right. I don't know how we pay for it, but it's a good idea. Um, so I love that. You might be hitting a little too close to home with my life filled with baseball games and family stuff, but uh, I get it. I love, I look, I love baseball. I played it all through my, I played through my first year in college. I mean, I grew up with all that. I love it all, you know, but it's, in, look, we only get one shot at this thing, this life thing, and you got to make choices and you can't do everything. It's, it's interesting, right? Right. And it is cool, right? Like it's like the sliding doors movie or something like who knows what path if you had taken another path six years ago or not said, no, I'm too busy. I can't take that Asian trip of whether you'd still be here or whether you'd be there or wherever. I had a, I had a psychologist on my podcast named Allison Gopnik. She had writes about something she calls Bayesian babies. And the idea is, is that when you're a baby, you don't really have a plan. You try something, and if it works, you try more of it. And you just kind of follow along the path. And you don't really, you know, you just go, what's the path of least resistance that feels good? That's kind of how I'm here. It's not normal. It's not normal when you get to be an adult in America to have a Bayesian mindset because what we want to do is plan everything. And if we see something, 
that could be really interesting, if it doesn't fit into the plan, we literally don't do it. Of course, I'm also talking about trend following too, right? right. People, get an, people get an idea of what they want to do with their investments. And if something all of a sudden does something unexpected, even if it could be huge, a huge windfall, if they did not plan for it or predict it or imagine it happening, they don't do it. So we've got a lot to cover on today's pod, but can you um, start with a little background on how you got into this crazy world of trend following? I have to go back and look through my exact notes, but I think I read the Market Wizards book in early 94, I think. And then I found out about the turtles. I remember picking up a magazine in Borders Bookshop, summer of 1994, Borders, rest in peace. Yeah, it was Financial World's top 100 paid on Wall Street for the year of 1993, I believe. And number 35 or number 37 was Jerry Parker. And I actually have a picture of the article here somewhere. I'd have to find it. But Jerry Parker was number 35 or 37. He was, I think it said he was 35 or 37 years old. And he had made like $35 million for the year of 1993. 35 cubed. Yeah, and it was like a little brief paragraph, and it said he was a, a turtle trained by Richard Dennis. He was not close to Wall Street. He liked country music. He lived approximately at that moment in time, 90 minutes from my house in Virginia. And I thought, to, and he was doing a trend tracking system. So for a guy who was thinking, with all of my bad grades, I'll never be reading balance sheets like Warren Buffett, I was like, who the hell is Jerry Parker? What is a turtle? What is a trend tracking system? Who is Richard Dennis? And it was that light bulb moment because I thought to myself, if this guy exists, and I don't know anything about him, if he exists, that means anybody can do it. Now, that's a little naive, but it's a little true too. Yeah. And that was my thinking. And I you know, pulled on that string. It took a long, it took a long while to meet Jerry, but I did. And you know, peace, 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 peace piece things together. I put up a website in 1996 called Turtle Trader and I had a first book come out in 2004 called Trend Following. And this podcast, my podcast started in 2012. Um, a few things there. One, I think that's probably the first and last time Jerry Parker's been called Wall Street, <laughs> right? You probably didn't like that. Um, and then two, he's great. We've had him on the pod with his pet parakeet. Um, we've had Salem Abraham on, who was introduced to trend volume from Jerry Parker. So, yeah, once you start to peel back that onion and see all those layers of all the people, uh, it's quite interesting. And so some people, there was some confusion. I remember back 15 years ago when you were still in the U.S. and we were doing some stuff together back at Attain days. Um, some people were saying, is he a turtle or is he not a turtle? So you, you weren't an actual turtle yourself, right? No, I, I don't think anybody ever thought that except it may have been one of our crazy clients or something, but somebody, yeah, I, I, I remember think being the, in the middle of some argument. I'm like, hold on. The, I don't think he, the, he's a the good lud, the, the lunatics on the inside of assorted chat forums, perhaps, but no, I was just a guy who was inspired and I've been very frank. I mean, look, my, my book, the complete turtle trader is very frank about that. And you just mentioned Salem. I don't think, I don't think I could have written the book, The Complete Turtle Trader. I don't think I could have put that full story out there without Salem really opening up. He was the first person, even a little bit before Jerry, I think Salem was the first person to peel back. I mean, Jack had written some great books, but Salem was the first person to really add some context to the whole story. And especially Salem was so important because he was the guy that was really like, okay, here are the original turtles and people can make an argument. Oh, you know, Rich picked these very smart people and, he, and Rich did pick very smart people, i.e. Jerry. But Rich picked also some- his money, right? Like that's his right. Yeah, right. But Rich also picked some absolute, you know, idiots. One of them has been in and out of jail for the last 10 years. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's this- People could say, well, the turtle thing was special and it was, it was confined. 
But Salem, of course, Salem, very special guy too. But he kind of, he really, I think, and I tried to make the case with this, he took it from, you know, that kind of first generation Jerry to second generation Salem. And that kind of just inspired everybody to think, well, if I really want to be a quant, a trend following quant, I can take a shot at it. Right. We'll talk about, right, Jerry, sure, he wasn't in the infrastructure, but he was up there in Chicago off the trading floor and working with these traders. Salem was just like, I'm going to do this from my ranch in Canadian Texas. So it's like, yeah, if you can do it from but, there, you could do it from anywhere, basically. But so Jerry, Jerry, though, I mean, in his start, he wasn't in Chicago. He was only there because Rich brought him there. I mean, yeah, yeah. What? So can you just for our listeners, I'm sure 95% of them know the story, but can you give us a two minute overview of the whole turtle trader story as far as you unpacked it and found found out about it? Yeah, Rich Dennis was this really interesting guy, strong political views, strong personal views, made his first million bucks on the floor in Chicago in 1976, floor trader. And he had amassed a lot of money in 76. Yeah, yeah, a huge amount of money in 76. And by 83, 82, 83, I think he had amassed a couple hundred million dollars, 200 perhaps. He went and saw the movie Trading Places with his partner, Bill Eckhart, a quite well-known trader. They walked out, my understanding, and Rich said, we can train people. And Bill said, no, you can't. And they made a bet. They hired people off the street to prove that Rich was right. I'm thousands of Wall people. Street Journal, right? Yeah, thousands of people applied. They selected approximately 20. They trained them for a couple of weeks. And at the end of that couple of weeks, sent them off to trade. At the end of four years, they made... I don't know, north of $100 million. Then all of those turtle traders, nicknamed for many different purported reasons, from the musical group, the Turtles, to a Singapore turtle breeding farm, to a group of young guys that wanted to be turtles. I don't know. I've heard all kinds of stories. <laughs> I'm going anyways, with the turtle farm. Yeah, anyways, when it was all over... Those, those students left working for Rich Dennis. They went out on their own, like Jerry Parker. Jerry, I don't know, in the 90s, ended up managing well over a billion dollars. And that was it. That was just this. And that story inspired, I'd have to go look through my notes. I can't tell you how many professional fund managers have been inspired by that story. I believe that David Harding is on record. That was one of his early inspirations. I'm and I think also, not, I don't think, I know, the new Jim Simons book that came out last year from Gregory Zuckerman, Simons My talks laptop about is sitting on it right now. Um, yeah, Simons talks about Rich Dennis being, you know, a huge influence where they went on his trading. So it's, a, it's an amazing story. I think sometimes in the online world, people get lost in all kinds of whatever, but it's a really, really important story. It's not a cute story. It's a cute name, and that sometimes bastardizes the story, but it's not a cute story. It's a very important story for two reasons, the method and the, sh the act of learning, which gets, you know, the, the idea that you could transfer the learning. And it two predated, million. right? Today, you would transfer the learning via a computer model, right? So it predated computer models, it predated all that. So it was transferring the learning by a set of rules, right? It was essentially a computer program written down on a piece of paper. Yeah, and some of the turtles ended up coding during, during that yeah. time there. I, you know, look, they were, I mean, if you go back to somebody even like Bill Dunn, who was a, was a trend following trader early in the 70s, you know, these guys were all coding things early, whether it was Excel or Lotus or, or Fortran. That was happening early. It was archaic looking compared to today, but you know, you don't need all kinds of quote fancy algos to be a trend following trader. Right. That's not what it's about. Being a trend following trader and using code is more of a an accounting issue than it is like some advanced algos to predict some nonsense. It's none of that. And so the the story grabbed you and you you had never written a book. You're like, I need to write a book about this. What how did what was that like of going from I love this story, I want to make money to oh, I'm gonna write about it first? Well, I had a website up for eight years 
kind of showing people what was going on behind the scenes with the turtles. And then my right. first book came, my and first the rules book came out. were sort of hidden at first from everyone, but now they're kind of, I, kind of I don't, yeah, I don't, I, not by you, but I'm saying in general, they were, that was some, yeah. some of the mystery around the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I, my first book came out in 2004. And then my, my book about the turtles came out in 2007. So I, it, it was a long time coming for me to have a, yeah. to have a book about it. What was, was the first cool. book? Trend following. Got it. Yeah. Five, um, edition, five editions into trend following now. Right. So this one? Yep. Are you, that's can a you beast. My video that's or? a beast, huh? Yeah. I love this. Thing. Look, it's a little worn. I, mean, I got a little worn on there. If, if you don't read it, you can kill somebody with it. Yeah. I, my favorite thing you did there, which I don't see a lot, is all the comments in the, uh, in the margin. <clears throat> you know who told me that for the first time? the former very successful manager at Leg Mason, Bill Miller. He was one of, the first per, one of the first professionals I talked to about that book. And here's this value investor yeah. in 2004 reading trend following, telling me how much he liked the comments in the, in the margins. No, I love that. Because my brain goes right to, um, you know, I want to read that first but instead of all the stuff you put all the time and effort into. Um, so just the cool, the cool leftovers that I, I, I knew I wanted to have in there, but I didn't know yeah. where to put them. Uh, so what, so there was that book, then the turtles, then the other trend following books. So did you think you always wanted to be an author? That just kind of was one of those Bayesian paths you took. Yeah, for sure. For sure. No, I had, I had terrible grades in school. I didn't care about school at all. So completely self-taught uh, author completely. So it, look, it's just another one of these little examples in life. I'm not tooting my own horn, but the reality is if you want to do something, you do it. If you don't want to do something, you talk about why you're not doing it. Right, right. Which leads me, so what advice do you have for other authors? Out there thinking, I've been trying to write a book for about six years. I can never finish it. Um, and I know- because you're, you're, because you're trying, you're not writing. Exactly, because <laughs> I have a day job, right? Um, and then I know Taylor Pearson, who we both know of Mutiny Fund. I, he's told me that you pushed him to write his first book. Yeah, I, I actually still remember where we were, where we were when that happened. I was, we were in a lobby in a hotel in Bangkok at a conference. And he was a little, I thought he had, he had some insights. And I thought he was a little indecisive. And he's a big guy. He's like, you know, yeah. four or five inches taller than me. And so I got in his grill and I was like, dude, you've got to write this. Don't give me any more excuses. Go write this dude. book. Some, something to that effect. But it, mu it must have been a qu a quite a funny looking uh, exchange thing to, to other people because this guy, you know, I'm six foot, but he's like six five. And I was kind of, uh, you know, he probably could have picked me up if, if he didn't like what I was saying. But I, I looked a little crazy. So he was he was kind not to uh, hit me. So. Right. Well, he did it. The rest is history. Do you follow his blog as well? Like he does, he puts out nice essays of whatnot. Yeah, I see some stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's tough when you do a podcast. I don't know how many episodes you guys are into now, but I'm doing a couple a week and you, you sort of, you sort of lose track of the rest of the world. when you're doing yeah. a podcast that requires a couple episodes a week, you're like, what's going on with the rest of the world? I don't know. Where am I? What country am I? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Who knows? Right. You're just so into those guests and into what they have to say. And some of the stuff you're talking about is like, right, you're not talking about current events. You're talking about philosophically and what you need in order to stick with the trend and things like that from a behavioral standpoint. Yeah, um, all, of my, all of the guests I try to have on my show, I want everything to be timeless. If I'm, if I'm talking only current events, I've kind of screwed up. Right. Which is those, I listen to those like mostly sports podcasts, right? But those have their place, but not for our work. <coughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. And so one I, of the fav sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, if, if, I, I do occasionally like to listen to Skip Bayless for you know, a period of time. So Yeah. And then you mentioned you played baseball in college. Where was that? I played at Randolph-Macon for a year, small okay. college in Virginia. But I, yeah. I, I played with a lot of guys that were really good. But, I, but after my first year, I was like, okay, I'm going to transfer somewhere, go transfer to Division One, play somewhere. But then 
at that level, it ceases to become fun. It ceases to become a, it, it becomes a job. Yeah. And, and, and then it becomes, it almost felt like military to me. I was like, well, this is no longer fun. And so yeah. I, especially you know, when you're in college, you're going out to run at six in the morning and your friends are coming home. Yeah. And it's like that famous line in the movie Moneyball. And I'm going to paraphrase here, but there's something to it with baseball when they, when they tell you you can't play anymore or when you stop playing, there's this feeling. It's almost a depression. I mean, look, I got a buddy who got to, I got a buddy who got to triple A, was going to make the Astros out of spring training back in the 90s with Biggio and Bagwell, was going to be their fifth starter. In a spring training game, actually struck out Cal Ripken and Brady Anderson, tore his rotator. Uh. Never, never got it back again. Yeah. And, you know, so, and, you know, there's, there's a certain, when that, when that kind of, with baseball, it's a funny thing, man. Can you imagine? I mean, just imagine getting to that level and you know, you know what the income potential is. You know right. what the earning potential is and, and, a, and a shoulder gives out on you. Oh, he's, he's struck out Cal Ripken one more time than you or I have. So speaking of famous people, so one of the favorite parts of your books for me are the uh, the stories about all the legends in the space. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the people you've highlighted. Um, my short list is Harding, John Henry, Bill Dunn, Sequoia, uh, and more. So give, give us some stories. We've talked a little bit about Salem and Jerry. What other stories do you have from some of those chats? You know, all their, their trading success is pretty well known. People can see that in my books. I think the fun part for me was how I ended up meeting a lot of them, how I ended up becoming friends often. I still think to the first experience meeting Bill Dunn, you couldn't get any more of a random experience. My father is a dentist. He says to me one day, he knows I'm doing this investigation in the mid nineties of all these traders, but he doesn't know anything about it. And he says to me, hey, you need to go talk to Marty. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he goes, you need to go talk to your old baseball coach. So I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, 10 years ago, Marty? He's Wait, like, yeah, stop. Need- Marty Dunn was your baseball coach? Let me, let me finish this so, one. <laughs> you got me overexcited. So, so I, said, I said, hold on. I, I'm like 26. You mean my baseball coach when I was 16? I need to go talk to Marty Bergen about what? Bergen, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, yeah and so he's like, he's like, well, he, he works with some trader. So <laughs> I, go, I, I go and I, I meet with Marty, and Marty lived one block from my house in Vienna, Virginia. I had not seen him for 10 years. But then I pulled out the Stark report, and I, I realized Marty was doing audit work for Dunn Capital, and I looked at the Stark report. I knew all about John Henry, knew all about the turtles. And I was like, who is this Dunn Capital? There's like no information on this guy. And his performance was massive. His assets under management was massive. His track record was out the wazoo long. Yeah. So I go to, I go to meet Marty. Marty sends me down for an informational interview. This is before Marty worked for Dunn. Yeah, now he's in and, charge. <laughs> yeah, he's the boss now. And so I go down and I meet with Bill. And that was just, you know, I still remember the handshake, the first handshake with Bill Dunn. Wow. Like, okay, nobody. I mean, I'm a a decently strong guy and I was prepared for anything, but that guy, I mean, I'm sure there's someone listening that also shook hands with Bill Dunn in his prime. I'm talking, that was vice grip stuff, man. That was, that was, I know it was like Walter and Jeff Eisenberg in my office had I've been down there to Stewart and met him. Um, their favorite story there is they have the like mobile trading unit or they used to back in the day where they could load up the RV, you know, if a hurricane was coming and take the show mobile. I don't know if they still do that, but that was a good one. So that was, that was fun to, and to see at this time, we're talking like 1996 and I'm still kind of investigating things and to see the Dunn office at that point in time. So here we are with a track record that's, I don't know, from like 74 to 96 already. And I go in the office and it, it felt like an accounting office or a legal office. And there was one monitor in the office at that time. And it was hooked up to some server sitting on the ground. 
And I was just meet, meeting everybody in the office. And at some point in time, an alarm, like almost like a red alarm hanging on the wall. They're going to kill me if I'm saying this wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is true. It's like a red alarm hanging on the wall and it kind of went off. And the guy that I was talking to casually got up, walked over, looked at the monitor. He said, we got a signal. He placed a call, came back and sat down with me. I mean, it was this most <laughs> interesting. Than a Goldman trade desk, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that was, uh, and look, you know, Dunn's a little more complicated today and whatnot. But I mean, I think the, the root of their success is still in the rules and the philosophy. It's not that they have to be some show, like, yeah. you know, some, like, like you know, the, the Solomon Brothers trading floor that everyone saw in the big short, you know, that, it's none of that stuff. Right. But that was, a, that was a fun experience. And I think also for me, meeting Ed Sakota for the first time was really interesting. And that was kind of a random thing. I had registered the domain name edsakota.com. Huh. Okay. I had registered the domain name for about every trader that possibly existed. Smart. That's I didn't have any, I, I wasn't going to hold them hostage or anything. I just yeah, yeah. was going to create websites. And Ed, one of his representatives sent me an email and said, hey, we'd like the Ed Sakota domain name. That's all they said. And I signed the piece of paper, dropped in an envelope, didn't ask for anything. Just sent it off, gave it to him. He asked for it. I gave it to him. Yeah. A couple, week, couple weeks later, they said, hey, do you want to come chat with Ed? And I went down and I chatted with Ed in the Virgin Islands. And the first question, I think the first question he asked me was, what was Richard Dennis looking for when he selected his students? First question he asked me. And Ed, Ed was kind of a wild guy at that. I'm not wild. I don't really, that, it's not the right word, but he was just as an interesting guy. We were sitting in, thinker, right? Yeah, we were sitting in shorts and T-shirts with our hair looking crazy on the side of a beach drinking a beer. And he says to me, what did, what did Rich Dennis look for? And were you like, was, no, I'm supposed to be interviewing you. Yeah. No, no, no. I, you know, I, you know, you're, you, I'm a young guy. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer his question. <laughs> yeah. But I said, I said, I thought he was looking for people that could think in terms of odds. And his next response, I'm pretty sure, because I've said this in books, I think I'm right in my memory, but I said, he said to me, who told you to say that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, then you're, you're like realizing, okay, it's a whole different level of, of intelligence going on here. You know, I'm not, right. I'm not going to get away with bullshitting this guy. Right. He's playing chess. You're playing checkers. Yeah. yeah. Um, who else? And did you ever meet John Henry or no? I did meet him briefly. I, I, and I, one of the questions that I asked him a quite one question I asked him that really stood out because we were, there was a hotel attached to one of the World Trade Center buildings in New York, like a little, a little Marriott or something. And he was speaking. And I remember I had, I remember Peter Borsch was in the audience too. It was maybe like 50 or 60 people. And it was a couple months after he was on the other side of the Barings Bank trade. And he, well, there was like, afterwards there was a cocktail party and like nobody was talking to him. <laughs> He's the guy that just gave a speech. He's like standing in the middle of the room I mean, you know, it's kind of a busy cocktail event. You know, if you get a bunch of bankers, a bunch of wanker bankers sitting around talking, yeah. they think that, but he's standing there and he's not yeah. a very big guy. You know, he's pre, kind of slight. He's pre-billionaire, right? So he doesn't have a target on his back. I would, if this was 1994, five or six, 1995, oh, so I guess. Might have been there. 1995. Well, he had to have been worth at least a half billion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I walked. I walked up to him, and I, I one of the, the first things I, you could tell he was he was a little nervous. Like, you know, are, are people maybe just shy, introverted, you know, and you know. But I, I said I want. I, I asked him about what kind of advice would he give to somebody that wanted to follow in his footsteps, and he was so like his body language. <laughs> He looked like he had the stress of the world on his shoulders at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. not, not after winning the World Series, you know, no stress then. But he just looked at me and he said, it never gets easy losing money for people. <laughs> right. And he was in a pretty hefty drawdown around then, maybe a little later. But 
no, 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 no. 1995. That would have been a f- couple months after winning bearings. He would have been the oh yeah behind, behind the scenes. He would have been the most popular guy on Wall Street. He was the you know it wasn't stated publicly that he was the winner to the opposite side of ba- of bearings and Leeson, but all the brokerage firms knew he was the big dog. And did have you analyzed that trade? He wasn't on it on the other side on purpose, right? It was just via the trend model. Yeah, Mia's model is, is now. Look, at that at that stage of the game, can can one theorize? Okay, he was supposed to be Leeson's long, he's short. Could I theorize? Could I speculate? Could I hypothesize that possibly, as Leeson was long and he was short, his system that he had some information through channels. I'm just completely guessing. I don't know that this to be true in any way, shape or form, yeah. but nobody else made, I don't think as much money. I mean, other traders made a lot of money on that trade, Bill Dunn, for example, but, but John really made a bloody fortune. Now it could have just been a function of what his assets under management were at the time too. I think he was much larger than other, other traders that, at that moment. I love it. That's a story for another day. The, uh, what's that movie with, uh, Who's the guy who plays Obi Wan Kenobi? Um, yeah, but do they even talk about? Do they even talk about John Henry in that? I don't think so, and not that I can remember. I haven't seen it in a long time, but um, not that I can remember. You know, the only reason I the only reason I learned about that though was being in a room where the head of two brokerage firms were talking about who was on the opposite side, and I overheard the conversation. <laughs> and then I just overhearing that conversation, I decided to run with it and make it a central point of my trend following book in 2004. So I could have gotten a lot did of Did everyone trouble. ever come tell you that you got it wrong? So it's. I wouldn't be talking to you if I got it wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 10 people told me I got it wrong, but I still go there. I still tell the story. Yeah, no, if, I, if I got, if I got it wrong, uh, Mike would have been facing a lot of pain. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's going to be in the back of my head the rest of the pod now. Who who is Obi Wan? I'll have to Ali look it up on the phone. I, I uh, uh, not not uh, his, not uh, Hayden Christensen. No, the no, he guy. was the other guy. Um, yeah. It'll come to me in a sec. So what about? And then there's those videos of you and David Harding walking through London. What was I? I actually met with him once and did a little interview. We put a blog post out. But what was he like for you? He was cool. I had a chance to, many times to meet up with David. He was very down to earth. Yeah. In fact, the very the very first time I met with him was before those videos. That was done for a documentary film. And again, I'm not trying to tell trading stories. I think if anybody takes something from this, it's like, okay, if you're interested in something, if you're curious about something, ultimately it's like Anthony Robbins' advice. Go find the people that are doing it. Try and learn from them. Try and give them something. Maybe they'll give you something. It's but I remember it was yeah, after, my, after my trend following book, I decided to write a second book, maybe the January of 2005. So this is eight months after trend following came out. And I just called up randomly like 15 traders that I wanted to interview. They all took my call and like 13 or 14 of the 15 agreed to interviews. And at the time they were managing like a collective 15 billion under, under management. David was one of them. So on my dime, I just started flying around the world to talk to these people. And David was one of them. And we just sat in his personal office and I had not written about him in my trend following book. At least I don't think I had. And I remember he was kind of, he was very British and he pulled up a monitor and he was showing me equity curves of various traders and he was showing me the equity curve, some of the names that I've already mentioned. Then he was showing me his, and he was superimposing them. Or, or the, it was a return, maybe a cumulative return. And he yeah. was superimpo- superimposing them. And at that moment in time, he didn't have to tell me anything. It's like, okay, clearly David is doing better than a lot of people. And it was kind of that toothy smile wink at me of like, hey, yeah. How come you didn't write? How come? How come you didn't write about me? Because <laughs> <laughs> clearly, clearly, he was doing pretty damn good. So that was fun. That was fun. Say I was. 
that you were America centric at the time. Your apologies. Uh, I remember, the, the cool thing I remember about that though is that he, he like me, he had no problem dropping the f bomb. So here I am interv interviewing him for the first time. I don't know how many f bombs he dropped. Really, I didn't get. Yeah, that. It, yeah, it was so fun. I mean, well, I mean, I, I, I so maybe the two of us were sitting there just dropping f bombs. I'm not trying to say anything bad. Look, he's, he's, I thought he was a normal, he's a normal guy. You know, he's done very well. He's a billionaire now, but you know, I always remember him as just a normal guy who shared with me and I thought he's really down to earth. And that's just my, that'll always be my takeaway. I don't, I don't know what happens when you become a billionaire, but uh, I'm sure, I'm sure deep down, he's still the same guy. Yeah. Um, so who of all the people, who'd you enjoy the best? Probably like picking your favorite child, but. Yeah, these guys are, I mean, we're talking some of the great thinkers. Forget just trading. You know, these people are great thinkers and really self-aware, very clued into the markets, economics, philosophy, psychology. But I would say, and, and maybe if I had equal chance to be involved with all of them, I would have different views. You know, maybe you only get so much because you only have so much time. Yeah. But I think, I think Sakota, I think Ed Sakota had some kind of mystical intuition or perception of me that was, I don't know, almost eerie. Like, okay, that guy, that guy can see through yeah. everything. <laughs> and that was that was that was an interesting feeling to realize. And, and I still remember too. After I met him, I did some searches, and he had a teenage son at the time, I believe. And I found his teenage son's math paper on the internet, and it hmm. looked like hieroglyphics. <laughs> like I had no idea what it was at all, you know. And I thought to myself, "My God." what is what is ed what is going on yeah. in ed's head right like, this, this is the, this yeah. is the young son you know what <laughs> you know so it was like just this whole different level you know but on the flip side he was also a guy you could have a beer with and very totally. gracious you ever seen and, his uh video of him playing the guitar <laughs> about the whip saws i did a an event where i interviewed uh, i forgot larry height i did an interview where i interviewed ed and larry height in chicago i think it was in 2012 and Ed pulled out his banjo for that audience, yeah. like for the example. And <laughs> David Harding was in that audience that day, pulled out his banjo and played that song for everybody. So it was great. We'll put it in the show notes. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's something about the trends, your friend, then you get whipsawed and to a nice banjo tune. Um, and you've talked a little bit. Common traits are just they're, you know, great thinkers, uh, unique thinkers. Any other common traits you think you saw between them? I mean, skepticism, you, like skepticism basically doesn't exist in modern life for most people. Most people just accept what they're told. Right. That's these kinds of, these, these, Believe these kinds of people, these kinds of people don't accept what they're told. They exist. They exist on the outside. Maybe that's the reason I would get along with them is they could see in me, I had the same kind of personality that I just didn't care about all this other stuff. Right. You weren't the next uh, Bloomberg reporter coming to talk to him. And look, the average person sees the net worth of John Henry or the net worth of David Harding, and they become, in their mind, gods. Where, yeah. you know, I still see them as regular guys who put their pants on, very smart, some great success. But I, I think there's people have lost sight of how to analyze and figure out things. I mean, even a guy like Jeff Bezos, I mean, the reality is he put up a website. Yeah. He started selling stuff. And then everybody realized you could buy stuff from there. It doesn't mean he's a god. It means he's a very smart guy who had a great idea. But I think we, 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 we make people into gods instead of like understanding who they are and what happened in their life. And Yeah, there's a great... Uh... There's a good Josh Brown blog post about the new American gods. And it's like Jeff Bezos, Apple. It's kind of saying those fang stocks like have replaced religion for most people. Like those are 
right? That's the new goal of everyone is to become there. I mean, um, look, look at, look at this thing that just happened right now. This, this relatively young guy who started Zappos died, uh, Tony yeah. Shea. Yeah, yeah. And, and I knew, look, I mean, when you hear a story that a guy who's 46 years old dies in a house fire worth $700 million, you say to your first thought is like, at least my first thought, and this is like, I think some of the guys you're asking me about, I think their first thought would have been, that's not the real story. 99% yeah. of the world goes, that's the real story. Then the real story comes out and we all immediately find out, hold on, the guy that was writing books about happiness was perhaps one of the most unhappy people around. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's not talking bad about someone who's not here. That's just doing an honest autopsy, and I, uh, an autopsy of life. And I hope people do it to me. I hope, I'm sure you hope people do it to you. Like rip us apart. Yeah, Find out what it. makes us tick. Like don't, don't just read the headlines. Find out, is that person real? Is that person not real? Look, I could, if you were here right now, I'm in a city of 15 million people. I could literally, I don't speak the language. I could take you and drop you off in some area, me and you, and it would look so foreign. You'd be like, where are we? We're completely <laughs> lost. I have a sense of direction. I have, I have a sense of knowing how to navigate it. And that's, that's fun in life, you know, when you can start to understand the patterns of life and realize that all the headlines are just bullshit. It's all noise. Um, I love it. Right. It's hard for me because most of the people we're talking to on this podcast and in my day to day are huge skeptics. Right. But I guess we're I'm in the bubble of the one percent who are skeptical <laughs> of the world that way. Um, yeah, you're, for, you're for you're for sure in the bubble. We're all in the bubble. <laughs> I guess it's the good bubble. I, or I, I don't know. It's like in the Matrix. Right. Of like, just give me the pill and let me eat the steak and pretend I don't know it's real. So back to the book real quick. The one section I like in there, you have the drawdown charts of some of the most famous uh, people and their big drawdowns. Oh, I closed it. Now I had it up here, but there's like Bill Miller, Warren Buffett, right? And there's some like 80% in there, 50%, 60%. So it seems like managed futures and trend falling sometimes held to a different standard or unfair standard when some of those icons have had these big drawdowns. What do you, you have any thoughts on that? Why that is? Well, sure. There's people, there's lots of people that want to manage lots of investors' money. So if somebody runs a big mutual fund that doesn't really do anything and has this hocus pocus annual report talking about how good they are at picking things and this and that, and then this alternative form of thinking, trend following, comes along and wants to bring assets from the mutual fund to the trend following world. Well, yeah, they're going to say anything bad they possibly can <laughs> about trend following. Right. Right. And they're um, here. I pulled it up real quick from your, from your book, Warren Buffett, 43%. Although I've seen bigger than that in other books, like 50 something. Uh, Ken Hebner, 56%, Harry Lang, 59% fidelity, Bill Miller, 50%, Ken Griffin, 44, Carl Icahn, 81. I think that Munger in 73, 74, before his partnership with Buffett, Munger was in the 60s or 70s. Yeah, right. And that's when they decided to basically stop having clients, right? And to create a company. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I don't know, is this still a debate much? I mean, I, I don't know if it's, is, well, is, trend, is, is trend following a philosophy still really, you know, looked down on? I, I think there's enough smart people that have done enough big success at it. I mean, people can say, I don't want to do it, but I don't know if people really can say it's not valid. Are they, is that not valid argument still out there? It's still out there because not because of the sharp downturns, but because of the length. So right. Basically since 09, it's been flat. Um, Ren, I always use AQR's mutual fund now as kind of the proxy and it went to, 18 billion and now it's back down to three or four billion so and i agree with you on the institutional investors they get it they just put some money put an allocation in there and kind of set it and forget it they know it'll be there when they need it but i think for the grand majority of investors and especially more retail investors 
they can't handle the, which you've written about, which we can talk about, but they can't handle the behavioral aspect of it. And right. They want the negative skew thing. That's small up, small up, big down. They prefer that because they never see the big down. They don't want to think about it until it happens to trend volume can be the small down, small down, small down, big up. It's going to be really interesting to see in our lifetime if we ever experience something in the States like Japan. Yeah. Everything, in Amer- everything in America right now, by hook or crook, is built on having U.S. stocks at all-time highs. Yeah. If that model doesn't exist, if U.S. stocks at all-time highs doesn't exist, and this means we could have U.S. stocks at all-time highs because we eliminate interest rates, because we sink the dollar, because X, Y, Z, whatever, as long as it's like the, the, the psychology. Now though, they're holding hostage the stock market to like, you got to push through stimulus. You got to send people checks, right? Or like, we're going to have a little 2% down temper tantrum unless Congress figures out how to send everyone a check. Well, and what's so interesting about this, this current all time high moment where we have to take all these actions to get it there, the stimulus, the zero or negative rates, et cetera. No one seems to have any thought that this could break. No. Like, like, and I remember, I remember in my documentary film, Salem had this great analogy and he kind of said it in the, this homespun way. He's like, you know, no one thinks about the meteor hitting. They just don't have that in their calculus. And it's like, okay, if we're at this moment in time where we're doing everything we possibly can do to be at all time high stocks, if you're an old person, put your money into all-time high stocks. If you're any person, put your money into all-time high stocks. Don't ask a question. Don't do anything. Just put it there. And don't think ever there could be a problem because <laughs> there can't be a problem because we are the Wizard of Oz. That's right. where we're at today. That's life today. And, and or they believe there could be a problem, so they might put it in trend following. But if it doesn't work for six months, then like, oh, this isn't working. I got to get back into what's working. And you're like that. You're missing the entire point. You're in there because it may one day not work. But right, if that stretches five years, that stretches ten years. What if that goes thirty years? Right, then I, you'll even start to see institutions be like, you know what, this trend following is not worth it. I think the other thing too in life, one has to decide what they want to be because there's a lot of stress. If one says, if one says in their life, I don't understand anything, but the system told me. I must be long stocks. I don't understand anything, but I must be long stocks. There's a hell of a lot of stress in that. Now, if you choose some other way to make your keep and you understand it, there's less, there's less stress over the course of a lifetime. If, if you don't constantly compare yourself to your neighbors, because if you constantly compare yourself to your neighbors, that's a really crappy life. You're going to be you know, oh, my neighbor's doing this, my neighbor's doing that. I mean, that's no way to yeah. live. you got a and big uphill is- battle there in the U.S., right? Like, because that's what happens day in, day out with portfolios, right? Of like, oh, I know I'm in this, I know I'm in the right portfolio. I know I did the process well, but oh, wouldn't it have been great to be an only fang? And wouldn't it have been great to own those Tesla calls? And right, they get so, right, the the neighbor effect is is huge and they want to just go into that. Yeah, and that's, that's just uh, poison. I agree. Well, look, I, I mean, I, I do tend to think, and not tooting my own horn, but I, I do tend to think that at some stage of the game, many people in the States, and maybe something like COVID helps to break it apart, people are just going to say this, this particular rat race that's been constructed for us, this particular matrix of thinking we must be in a nine to five gig, working for the man, be stuck at all time high stocks, never see any interest income, and then sit around and argue about which politician we like on the left or right. This doesn't seem like much of a solution for for living. Yeah, this for seems, happiness. Yeah, it seems very noisy. Yeah, it seems it seems noisy and, and messy as hell. Yeah. The um, but you can't. I mean, even you must see like some of these guys. Or let me frame it a different way. Do you think uh, Sakota and John Henry and Dunn, you think they could do what they did back in the 70s and 80s today? Like the, the market for sure has changed, right? 
I don't know. You just talked about the Fang stocks. Oh, I mean, what's 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 trend following? I mean, I, I give Jerry Parker credit for this. What's yeah. what's trend following? Trend following is a philosophy, and then there's an assortment of instruments that can be traded. Now, of course, historically, at least from let's say the '70s until to the 2000s, you know, it was typically defined around these commodity currency portfolios. Okay, but from a philosophical standpoint. What the hell is the difference? I mean, for a te- I mean, Tesla, Netflix, it's just a market. It's just people moving a market. So, right, Bitcoin. I think, right, theory. right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And what's the difference? I, I, I get that if we need to be fixed to constantly look at, you know, why a, a particular portfolio is set from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I get it. I've done it too in, in my books. But I think that's just foundational proof of the philosophy and the philosophy is adaptive to the host of markets that appear on the scene. And, right. and, and can you tell me right now, does anybody really think that humans have stopped pushing whatever market up or down? Has anyone seen that stop? Well, to the contrary, right? You see these stocks just go like, there's no way it can have a P of 200. Okay. Next month it's P 300 now 400. Right. Like to the contrary, the fangs just keep going up. And you and you make the point right there in the sense of P.E. I mean, can anybody with a straight face really tell (laughs) anybody that the fundamentals are useful for trading today? That is just 100 percent bullshit. There's right, no you still way see the articles of like, oh, this is expensive for historical cape ratios. Yeah. And yada, yada. It's uh, all it, I mean, and look, why is that? Because a lot of very smart people on this planet spent their youth being indoctrinated in schools with very smart professors. They spent all their time. They spent all their money. They're probably a lot smarter than me. Maybe it's a lot smarter than you. Maybe you did all this. I don't know. <laughs> but I got to tell you, all that training does not help them to, to trade these markets at right. all. How are you going to price it today? But I think some things have changed, right? Like microstructure, mar- market microstructure wise of like, now they know these trend followers and they can basically recreate all their models and they are likely to exit their Euro dollar aggregate trades around these levels. So we might front run that a little and that like makes the market go through stops and through different levels a little quicker. So I think there that, are different that, things. That gamemanship, that gamesmanship has been going on for a long time though. I mean, that, yeah, you know, I think it's always, a more sophisticated these days down to the actual like bid and offer and putting in spoofed quotes and things like that. But for but sure. Then you, but, but then if you pull yourself out and you kind of uh, diffuse the look and get a little blurry on the lens and I look at the Tesla trend and I don't know, does it really make a difference what was going on intraday when you look at a five-year Tesla trend? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, and that's what's happened. Either trend followers have even either gone way longer term to whip out that noise over the last 10 years or shorter term. Um, but then you start to see some are, you know, the philosophy gets adjusted too. So they might tilt long bias. They might tilt we need more equities. So we could, we could debate it all day. But for yeah. you, I think your philosophy, right? is that it's not something that can break because it's a philosophy. How do you break a philosophy? And look, that philosophy is not any different than all the Sand Hill Road venture capital guys. It's not any different than Jason Blum making movies in Hollywood. It's the same thing. It's not any different than Moneyball. It's, it's the idea that we can't predict anything. So... We have to take many bites at the apple and many bites of those apples aren't going to win, but we're going to get some big trends. Look, ask Jeff Bezos, why is Amazon successful? They tried a million different things. Yeah. Some of them, some of them became Alexa, but you got to try. And that's, that's something that we don't really look at in life, at least in the discussion of a life philosophy is. We all want to be experts who supposedly can make one bet and it's going to be right. Whereas if you're making a bunch of bets, you're probably much better off because you're not going to be right. So 
take a bunch of bets and ride the ones that go your way and let go of the ones that don't. And I, I think investors don't like that, right? I always have this conversation with systematic guys and I'm like, well, you're on the phone with the investor. They're going to ask you what you think about oil. And I know your answer is, I don't give a crap what happens to oil. I'm systematic. It can go down. It can go up. I don't care who's drilling. I don't care about this. I'm like, I know that's your answer, but they want to hear you say something smart about oil. So can you just say something smart about oil? See, you're in a different position than me. You have to be um, politically correct or have a little diplomacy. You call them investors that actually talk like that. I don't know if I can use the term investor. I think maybe just... Uh, Maniac. Mindless, mindless. <laughs> uh, I could even go harsher, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be kind. I mean, they're, they're only investors in name only. They're just people in the system being told what to do. And they're just worried that they might do the wrong thing or their neighbor might get better. And it's a vicious circle. And look, at the start of this podcast, we were talking about country comparisons and stuff. Yeah. Look, one of the reasons America is dying from COVID is from obesity. I'm currently in the least obese country in the world. I wonder why there's 35 deaths here versus 300,000 deaths in America. This is the problem that we have in America right now. It doesn't matter what the subject is. Nobody wants to get real. Nobody wants to get honest, right? And getting right. honest is to talk about what's really going on. We can't do that anymore, right? So, yeah. so I, I would just recommend to all, to anybody out listening, is just when you look at life, when you look at making an investment or making a trade or figuring out a philosophy, get to something where you can be skeptical. Like if, you're, if someone's listening to you and I today and they think, well, you know, Jeff and Mike, they got these opinions or whatever. <laughs> no, that's, don't, don't listen to me. Yeah. Hear, what I have to, hear what I have to say. Prove me wrong. Right. Dig don't it make up your own. Rip it Gather apart. the data and make your own uh, calculations. Yeah, for sure. From what you've seen and from your tour, you mentioned, um, I know Asian institutional, but down, do you talk to like retail investors there? I know the like Korea is well known for day trading and Chinese love their day trading. What have you seen out of their investor mentality? So I happened to just randomly yesterday, I've become friendly with many of the large multi-billion dollar funds in Vietnam. Yesterday, I happened to be in an event where the head of the Ho Chi Minh Stock Exchange was speaking. Quite interesting fellow. And you know, it's, it's a emerging, developing place in terms of that structure. So it was interesting to hear the, and the real debate and the conversation from what the interviewer was asking the head of the exchange was the foreign ownership requirement issues. So the country, knowing that they're, the, knowing that they're developing, is still trying to keep some foreign ownership from dominating, whereas the foreign, ownership, the foreign investors want to come into Vietnam and put more money in yeah, they want but they're, but they're, they, you know, they, they're a little worried if, if the government is a, a little too strict on things. But I see it from both sides. So it's an interesting uh, yin and yang. And now, of course, something like Tokyo is much more mature. Yeah. Singapore, much more mature. Uh, so we, it's, it, look, it, it's just, uh, I would say this, though, from a big picture, even more important than talking about any one exchange or any one group of markets in Asia. Highly recommend this to all Americans. Now, if you're over 50... Even though you just told them not to listen to what you say, but go ahead. Right, but, but it, if, well, they can, they can go verify, okay? Right, trust, right, but right. Ver, trust but verify, Reagan Gorbachev, trust no, but verify. Right. So look, if, you, if you're an American and you're over 50, you, you might already feel like you're done and you're close to death, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, you're going to have younger people in your life, kids, family, whatever. Here's the reality. If you are pushing your kid to take Spanish in America, you're a blanking moron, okay? <laughs> because there is absolutely no doubt that every kid in America should be learning over Spanish. Choose whatever you want to choose. Japanese, Chinese, Thai, Vietnamese. I don't care. Even maybe right. possibly even it. No, but all eight, listen, 
There's going to be no middle class growth in Europe or America in the next 50 years. There's going to be a doubling of the middle class in Asia. Asia is going to kick America's ass in terms of growth. It's absolutely younger populations eager to get wealthy. And that's Look, ex China or including China? Everybody. Look, yeah. I, I, I mean, that like was China. the big, right? That was Jim Rogers and the China super cycle and everything of like that was happening. And then that's kind of quieted down. But um, I think for sure people have moved manufacturing out of China and helped the whole region, right? When the trade war happened, they're like, crap, we can't have all of our stuff at risk in China. Look, if, if the average American has never stepped foot in China, has never stepped foot in the financial district in Shanghai, or has never walked the streets of Beijing, let me tell you right now, don't read the headlines, don't listen to the headlines, but go there and you will see energy, you will see people, you will see stuff happening that you've never seen in the States. Oh yeah, and just their whole lives are on their phone. They're paying, they're doing everything. There's no, right? It's like they're well ahead of us on many levels. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm still American for sure, 100%. And I, I want America to do well, but I think we're gonna- You're still we're a gonna citizen, you didn't renounce for tax purposes? Listen, we're going to have, we're going to have, that was a nice dodge by me. We're going to yeah, have, a situ- <laughs> we're going to have a situation where America at some stage of the game will have to feel economic pain because of, because of Asia's economic gain. And we're going to have to learn how that works. Uh, we're going to have to learn how to navigate that. But I got to tell you, if you got kids right now and they're learning Spanish in America, you are really not a smart person because there's, it's, it's- <laughs> and look, se- uh, look, 75, 75% of American kids as a second language are put into Spanish. That's a, cr- that's a crime against humanity. I have nothing against Spain or Mexico, but from an economic development standpoint, from, from a standpoint of potentially your kids having a better life, they should be learning Chinese, Japanese, Thai, or Vietnamese 100%. I agree. Our, we do some business in China, which might be of interest to you. In the, uh, basically, some of these U.S. CTAs have taken their models and put them on the Chinese markets, which aren't accessible except for in-country. But they, they have directional volatility, like the markets used to be in the 80s. So you're seeing some of these returns. And you know it's like those old John Henry type stuff, because those markets move and the retail pushes them around a little bit more. And there's not as much institutional and commercial hedging that kind of caps it. So it's interesting. Like you said about philosophy, and you just mentioned John Henry in the 80s, but nothing's permanent. So the players that were popular or big at one point in time, it might ebb and flow. And look, let's face it, if you become John Henry and you got three, four billion dollars, you don't really care about the rat race anymore. You do your thing, you, yeah. you don't run a let's baseball in the World right? Series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I just think uh, it's... It's a philosophy and there's, there's no, everyone knows there has been no stoppage of trends across traded markets. It's just a matter of where and how does one have a strategy to take advantage of the markets that are popping and trending. That's it. Right. And well, the last 10 years, they haven't been in currencies or bonds, which is the bulk of trend followers portfolio. So the, the fault might be, hey, you should have switched around your portfolio versus that trend following doesn't work anymore. You know, you've done perhaps more for managed futures and trend following than anyone else with your books and podcasts and everything. Um, What advice would you have for new managers or existing managers that are trying to kind of navigate the social media and the modern world of, of getting attention out there? That's tough, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky, very lucky in the sense that when I saw Andreessen go public with Netscape in the summer of 1995, I said to myself, well, this is game on. Everybody's going to have a website within months. Yeah. And everybody's going to be remote working within months. Well, that didn't exactly happen, but it happened for me. And so I think that that, that is, it's more of a mentality thing, ultimately. Like, you know, you have to, if one, if one wants to start a new fund and they try to replicate exactly what everyone else has done, 
that's going to be tough. But I think also the other trick too is if, if you're starting a new fund, you're a trader, and you're putting all this time in to get your strategy and everything, well, then how do you become the personality to also be supporting it? I mean, look at someone like Jerry. Jerry Parker was not the guy you see today out talking and entertaining and giving great insights. Right, dude. He was behind he was behind the scenes for a long time, you know. Right. Back yeah, in the day, that, you never could have imagined him on Twitter, right? Right, but now he's fantastic and you know, there's there's and I so I think maybe that's one way that new people can start. They can look at what people like a Jerry is doing or even a Tom Basso in retirement. Look how they're navigating. Look, it's going to take time. Like you you don't get to just create a track record and that's enough. You've got to win over the hearts and minds. You've got to have a philosophy. You've got to present. So it's almost yeah. like if, if you want to do anything today online to win fans, to win clients, et cetera, you've got to become your own version of a rock star. If you yeah, don't, like who's, who, who's going to pay attention if you don't do it? Right. I liked what you said, become a personality, be a personality. I mean, just be yourself. Be your, it's almost like, okay, everyone's kind of interesting, right? Everyone is interesting, in my humble opinion. But people don't know how to be interesting to others. So that's the skill part. Like, how do you take your internal interesting and then learn how to broadcast that interesting? That's, that's the trick. I like it. And go multi-channel. Should they write a book? If they have something to say. Yeah. <laughs> If they have nothing to say, don't look, I can't tell you how many, how many books I've seen from Harvard professors from my podcast, Harvard professors, people with who knows how much training. And it's the book is 250 pages and I can usually synthesize it to one sentence. <laughs> That's, you know? I have a one sentence book that I, I, I have one sentence I want to turn into a whole book of the key lime pie diet. So you can only have dessert if they have key lime pie at the restaurant it doesn't work so well during COVID when you're not eating out, but I want to turn that look, in. I do, I do think my trend following book in some ways could be a one sentence book. But what I did with that book very specifically was to have the, the big idea. That you really, that, but everything is to back up the idea. That's the point. The point, yeah. the point is to say, well, okay, Mike, you've got this big idea, justify it. Well, that's what that book is. <laughs> Here's the big idea, and here's the justification. That's all. It's just a huge research paper. Right. And boy, is there justification. We end up all the pods asking you some quick fire favorites. So you ready? I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to. I, I have no idea what you're going to ask me, but I'm, I'm <laughs> as ready as I'm going to be. Yeah. Favorite Vietnamese dish, food dish. I can't even name it, but it's something with pork and vegetables that I can't name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, what are they? Uh, isn't it pho? Is what you eat in Vietnam? Oh, that is the that is the like, quintessential that is the quintessential American understanding. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad I could put that in my head. Yeah. Uh, no, it, 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 there's there's so many names and there's so many varieties, but I mean, there's this one there's this one street food lady that Anthony Bourdain made quite famous. And she puts everything you can possibly imagine from pork to vegetables to noodles in this bowl. And I just tend to think that if they served it in the best restaurants in America, the line would be out the door. Yeah. It's just, it's just delicious. All right. I'm coming to visit just for that. Um, other than your own favorite investing book. I think Jack's books, Jack Schwager's Market Wizards books. Yeah. There, there's, I know that sounds maybe trite, but the reality is those first two books, I mean, they're f especially the first one filled with guys like Ed Sakota and Larry Height, people that I became friends with. And what Sakota and Height say in that first book still jump off the page today what are we 30 years later, 32 years later, something crazy like that. Yeah. He just came out with a new one, right? Uh, unknown market wizards. 
Yeah, I just talked to him about that. It was, that was a great interview and he some great stories in there. Amazing stories, actually. I haven't read it yet. I'm going to have to go read it. Uh, favorite place to travel inside Vietnam? Good question. I was just on a plane the other day. I don't know if I have an exact answer, but I was just on a plane the other day for the first time in a year to a place called the lot in the little mountainous area that I think the French originally made as a retreat. It's quite nice, quite peaceful. It felt like the Virginia countryside or perhaps some parts of West Virginia. I mean, it was kind of pines and it didn't, was not tropical at all. It was, it was quite nice. What's the French historical connection? Well, the, they came over here and colonized the place and caused a lot of problems. And then America and its infinite wisdom uh, allowed the French to come in and out several times, especially after World War II, mm. to let the French save face. But, you know, ulti- ultimately, it's really interesting, even though the French caused a lot of problems, the Chinese caused, I mean, look, Vietnam has been occupied by four different countries in the last hundred years, the last 2000 years, Chinese, Japanese, French, and Americans. Yeah. And the Vietnamese really don't have a fondness for the Chinese. I don't hear much. I don't see, I don't hear them speak highly of the French, but they sure love the Japanese and they sure love us. Good. For once we're on the right side. Ja- um, Japanese, Japanese taste in engineering is highly valued in Vietnam. And, and that I love because if the country can ultimately get to Japanese taste in engineering, then that's, that's a positive. Um, favorite turtle trader. I don't know if you could pick just one. Well, it's Jerry, Jerry Parker, because he's the one that I've got a chance to know the most and talk to the most. But I will say, and he's, he's passed on, that Mike Shannon, who I interviewed for my Turtle Trader book, was the most interesting because I was told when I was doing this whole investigation, and it was, look, I was threatened with loss, not by Jerry, but I was threatened with lawsuits by a lot of people in the turtle world to write that book. Okay? They didn't want that book out. Uh, I had one turtle tell me uh, that I was going to be sued if, if, uh, if, the, if the name was even... This, this turtle's name was even in the book I was going to get sued. <laughs> like, I was like, what, lo- what lawsuit? What's the predicate for that lawsuit? I don't know if I follow that. <laughs> but they um, were concerned the rules were going to get out there and then their performance wasn't going to be as good? What was their general beef? or just? You know, there was so much secrecy built around it. And I, yeah. I don't know if it was respect for Rich. But this guy, Mike Shannon, I had been told was a, an interesting guy. And it took me a while to track him down. And I remember doing a a call with him. He was living in Australia. And I asked one of those questions that I don't ask often, but I was kind of like, is there anything that I've not asked you about that I should know about that you need to tell me about? (laughs) One of those questions. He said, Oh yeah. Did I tell you I was a criminal? I was the largest (laughs) Coke. I was the largest Coke dealer in Chicago. And I was working, I was working for rich and I was an undercover agent for the DEA and he didn't know. I was like, I didn't know any of this. Yeah. Okay. Good, good follow question. Uh, And he's passed away since. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you a a crazy small world story. Just to show you how small the world is. A young guy in Vietnam. Smaller than Marty Bergen being your baseball coach okay i'm a young guy that works in vietnam in his 20s he listens to my podcast he finds me he's working for a singapore family office that has billions under management okay interesting so one one day this german owner of this family office is in in ho chi minh city so the young vietnamese guy takes me to meet his boss we start talking he was friends with mike shannon what the hell I mean, you're just like, how did that connection happen? Right. You know? so. uh, and then lastly, we'll, I'll ask all our guests, favorite Star Wars character? Yoda. Yoda, I like it. He, he would have been a trend follower for sure. Very, look, look, if you live in Asia, like I have for a while, you get a certain Zen mindset. And I'd much rather have a Zen mindset than the mindset that I grew up with in the States. Because if you're going to have a, 
and, and, and the, the, we haven't talked about this, but that Zen mindset, that philosophical Zen is very much trend following. Right. Like, hey, the, the trends are going to happen. Just relax. They'll be here. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to overthink it. I like it. Are you a surfer? You kind of have a surfer mentality as well in a good way. No. Well, I mean, it depends on what I'm surfing. So Yeah. Surfing the trend. I mean, look, this, this is the, the way. This is the PG conversation, you know, the, the R rated conversation. You have to show up in Asia and speak with me in person. So perfect. Over a beer. They have good beer, right? Vietnamese beer is pretty good. There's a, you know, I, I don't drink really anymore, but there is a lot of beer drinking in Vietnam. Yeah. A lot. Uh, it's, it's, it's not fun when you do a, any kind of event in Asia, if you're not really drinking because Every Asian guy from Tokyo to Beijing to Singapore to Ho Chi Minh City, you go out at night. I mean, it's a comp it's a competition with brown liquor to see how much you can drink. And I can't drink any. So it's uh, I have yeah, to we, I have to be very strategic about how I navigate. We've had some of the Chinese partners over and they have bring this like just gasoline from there that they want you to drink. You're like finding every way I can to throw it over my shoulder. Hey, look, I'm not a prude. I, I did my share of growing up drinking everything under the sun, but you know, just, you know, you have and flow with it right now. I've, it's ebbed out of me. So. Well, I'll, I'll drink something, but the gasoline is just a little, little tough on me. Um, all right. Well, and now that you taught me, I need to ask anything else that I should have brought up or that I need to know Mike Shannon style. Mm, I will say this. I will say this, this is, this is this is one that, that it's not R rated, but it's it's going to be for some ears. Maybe they'll think, well, that's that's too much. I got to tell you, look, when I came to Vietnam, I was single, and I have to tell you that as a guy who grew up grew up, I'm 52, as a guy who was looking at Paulina Poroskova on the front of Sports Illustrated swimsuit issues. Yeah, I remember. Good 82, choice. 80, 82, 83, right? Yeah. And, see, and seeing that type of physique, and then to unfortunately, and I think this is part of why we're having such a problem with COVID, with the obesity, to see the expansion in America, and then come to a place where, look, I'm a guy, okay? I, I'm not apologizing for that. Um, but to come to a place where I can see the feminine form more like Paulina. That's, that's a real, that's a game changer in life because yeah. it's not, it's not the same in America anymore. It's, it's changed. And I, I, I don't think it's, I would love to see it change back. I would love to see us go the other, the other way. And I'm not just picking on ladies. Obviously obesity is an equal opportunity employer in America, men and women, of course. But again, I'm just, COVID. I'm a, Help that I put on about 10 pounds during COVID because you got you're constantly grazing through the kitchen. I put it on and then I've I've lost 30 pounds since May. Wow, good. So but anyways, I, I do think that the, the beauty And so your eyes were open seeing all these beautiful Vietnamese women, and then you met a Vietnamese woman. You said you're not married yet. Right. Yeah, the, the beauty part is really and there's a certain, I don't know if the beauty is also related to just a physical appearance. There's a, there's well, a the entirely, Zen. yeah, there's a different attitude. There's a, there's a, a, a softness, a kind of a tradition. It's just very different than, uh, than America. And it, it's, it feels, it feels older. Like, you know, so you can, you could talk to somebody, you could talk to a woman who's 25, 35, 45 and their mentality, they might not look, they might look absolutely dropped at gorgeous, but their mentality is like grandma. Their 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 thinking is is older. Yeah, it's interesting. All right. Well, as soon as this lockdown ends, we'll come visit. Gotta swing by uh, Australia. Do no, but nobody will from America will come visit. Only a handful because when you have to stop and think about it, you're like, hold on. Mike is probably crazy. <laughs> he's in. No, that he's in. What a, makes me want to visit. <laughs> he's in a communist country. Um, we had a war there. Um, Spike Lee just made a film that says there's landmines and machine guns everywhere. 
yeah, so people might listen and say, I'm going to go, but then they're not going to go. <laughs> but it's still become, it, before COVID, it was growing as a tourist destination, right? Mm. Americans. I thought, I'd had some, I knew some people who'd been there. It's pretty rare, to be honest with you. It's pretty rare. All right. But it, it's, it's very unusually rare to me, because when you're here, you're like, wow, if most Americans could experience this, they would be floored. I'm done. I'm in. Um, all right, Mike. Well, enjoy your day. It's your 9 a.m. us evening here, but enjoy your day. We'll have a good night and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for being on. Hey, thank you. Take care. This was fun. Let us know when you write your next book. It's coming soon. Nice. What's it about? We didn't talk about that. Trend Following Mindset. It actually is a book based on my podcast interviews with Tom Basso because he really helped to launch my podcast. Perfect. All right. I love it. All right. We'll look forward to it. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCMAlt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.